Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this uh, sixth session today in our October 2023 Sea Otter Science Symposium. It's been a, a great series of talks about a lot of things that are the context for understanding uh, how we might restore sea otters to the Oregon coast. So to this last uh, next presentation is Capturing Our Ocean Secrets, Sea Otter Detection Using Artificial Intelligence and Aerial Photo Surveys. And I would just say that uh, technology has entered every corner of our lives in amazing and very unexpected ways. I mean, who knew you could check on your dog and feed them uh, by uh, with using a video camera and a cell phone? So now we're going to dive into the realm of artificial intelligence and underwater conservation as we explore the role of artificial intelligence, or AI, in automating sea otter detection through photo surveys. In this presentation, we'll take you on a journey through the development and application of the AI model, particularly focusing on the pioneering efforts of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in conducting large-scale sea otter surveys across the rugged and remote Alaskan coast. As you might expect, uh, when you're dealing with a vast geography like the Alaskan coast, uh, sea otters are less than a tiny pinprick uh, in the image. So Colin Power, our next speaker, is working toward his PhD in a nutritional and isotopic ecology lab at the University of Colorado, but he also works as a contractor on these technologies for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to help uh, develop them and apply them to the world of sea otters. So Colin, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, so today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, how we're applying AI on, on a large scale, um, primarily through the lens of, you know, our work in Alaska for the past two years, um, you know, but the idea of, you know, my work, um, you know, and the, the work that we've done as a team over these past few years is, you know, hopefully develop tools that, that can be used, you know, beyond just Alaska uh, and hopefully beyond just sea otters. Um, so, going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the survey um, methodology and, and background. Um, then I'm going to get into, you know, our survey that we completed in, in Southeast Alaska. That was a, I mean, a huge feat, you know, covering, you know, well, something like 46,000 or 4,600 miles. Um, and then, you know, getting into how we're actually taking these photos, you know, and turning it into a, to usable data. Um, so, We'll go through that. Um, you know, I am a contractor for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, currently, I've been working with them for the past two years, you know, but these projects were in close collaboration with USGS and the National Park Service up in Alaska. All right. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, you know, I'm an ecologist at heart uh, through and through, and I've been doing field ecology for, for about a decade now, um, you know, mixture of you know, forestry and building long-term monitoring stations and you know even went through a, a while where i was sifting through dirt you know looking at individual roots you know trying to determine species of the root and you know root density within, within soil samples and you know hours and hours you know in the field and in the lab you know getting data you know that we could use and in process um you know from there i did a little bit of fire ecology in brazil um you know, and then moved on to some fisheries work, tagging cobia and, you know, American red snapper and mahi and, you know, uh, weak fish. So, uh, you know, we use mostly acoustic tags for those. And, you know, I was responsible for maintaining the underwater uh, acoustic array as well. Um, so, you know, got to do a lot of diving back then. Um, it's good. And, you know, really miss being in the field. You know, so, you know, how does somebody like myself who, you know, is very passionate about being outside and getting down and dirty, you know, how do they end up sitting behind a computer uh, for 40 hours a week and most times? Um, and, you know, hopefully I'll answer that question a bit today, but, you know, I just saw the, you know, massive inefficiency in, in a lot of this data collections and, you know, technology is always, you know, interested in me and, you know, I think that we're making leaps and bounds uh, in regards to AI, uh, so artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, I really think it's, you know, going to change the world, right? You know, as big of a, 
you know, change that we've seen with, you know, the invention of the smartphone or, you know, even the invention of Google, um, you know, even the invention of writing, right? It's it's one of those, what I believe, you know, monumental points, you know, so how can we har harness this, you know, incredible technology to free up more time for researchers to ask, you know, more interesting questions, um, you know, and collect more data. You know, my goal isn't to, you know, get rid of, you know, all of our field techs. My goal is to make sure that they're not sitting behind a computer for, you know, hours and hours on end burning out their retinas trying to, you know, look over imagery. Um, so you know, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about a bit today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get into that. So, you know, our main questions, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, these the survey work is, you know, where are they and, and how many are there, you know, looking at, you know, abundance and distribution. Um, and, you know, that was our, our main goal for the sea otter stuff. So, you know, that's kind of what we've tailored this for is, you know, counting um, otters across, you know, thousands and thousands of photos. Um, so, you know, a little history about, you know, surveying methodologies. You know, you can get, you know, some answers to these questions if you're, you know, tagging individuals um, or doing genetic studies. But but those are usually a little invasive and they, you know, require some pretty uh, incredible capture feats. Um, you know, and then we get into uh, observer-based studies, which are, are non-invasive, um, you know, but, you know, there are limitations. Um, so, you know, historically, there's been a lot of like skiff or vessel-based surveys, you know, where you're running along a transect identifying otters um, on a boat. You know, um, California has a great program of, of coastal uh, observations where you actually have people with telescopes, you know, sitting up on ridge and actually getting a full census of the otters, you know, on the near shore habitat. You know, but, you know, when we start getting to, you know, really remote and, and rugged coastlines like we see up in, in Alaska, and I know that there are a lot of Know, spots like this, you know, along the whole uh, sea otter range. So when we start getting into that, you know, we're really looking into these aerial surveys. And, you know, I've heard some pretty harrowing tales, you know, about biologists flying at 300 feet, you know, narrowly avoiding a cliff face because their transect runs right into, you know, an area of coastline. So, you know, how do we make these surveys more safe? you know, more efficient, uh, you know, and the cool thing about, you know, potentially having photo-based surveys is you have this, you know, historical record as well. So, you know, if I'm, you know, up in the plane doing a manual survey, you know, the only thing we have as record is that is my memory, which honestly is not very good at all. And, you know, the data that I've actually written down, you know, but, you know, so let's say I'm just looking at sea otters, we count sea otters and, you know, that'd be it, you know, occasionally we'd be able to, you know, take down some other opportunity data, but, you know, with this record, this photo record, we can go back and we could potentially map out kelp, you know, or we could look at seal and, and sea, sea lion distribution. Um, so I think there's a lot of really cool, you know, powerful ways that, that we can use these photo-based surveys to increase not only like the efficiency that we do surveys, you know, but also the, the data that we actually harvest from these surveys. Um, so, you know, Jamie Womble at National Park Service up in Glacier Bay, you know, kind of pioneered a lot of this transition to photo-based surveys, uh, you know, for the Alaska group, um, you know, and she did that roughly about five years ago, you know, using you know, two ca cameras shot out the window, um, you know, just to, to verify, is this possible, is this working, you know, and yeah, she was able to prove that, you know, we're able to fly at, at higher altitudes, you know, faster speeds, you know, and still get very comparable data than what we see in these, you know, observer-based studies. Um, but then, you know, you get to the problem of, of applying that on a large scale. And, you know, that is where, you know, I really came in, you know, in my work and kind of developed a uh, an AI model, but also a validation um, program that allows, you know, people, researchers, to go in, you know, upload their images, process it through this machine learning model, um, and then get actual usable data out of that. Um, so, um, you know, here are a couple a little out of the window shots. You know, I had the, I was incredibly lucky and had the opportunity to go up for the 2022 um, summer survey of, of Southeast Alaska. 
Um, so, you know, there, that's Mount St. Elias over there in the uh, far right. You know, as you can see, we don't have a lovely little coastal highway running all down here. Um, you know, a lot of these spots were, you know, pretty far from, you know, where we would be able to refuel, land. Um, so we had to, you know, have a, a large plane um, and, you know, dual engine plane, especially just for safety reasons. But, you know, I can always see this stuff going with smaller scale drone based surveys as well. Um, so that's something that I'm definitely interested in. Just want to give a shout out to Evan Weatherington, who is our, our lead software development on, developer on this project. You know, he was huge in actually kind of bringing this all to fruition and, and making it accessible for, you know, everybody, um, not just somebody who's a computer scientist. I want to thank uh, Ben Weitzman and Paul Schutte. Um, both are uh, biologists with the Marine Mammals Program, you know, focusing on sea otters up in Alaska. You know, they are the ones that really made this project happen, you know, got the funding, you know, got the airplanes, had to deal with all the logistics of, you know, a huge survey like this. And, you know, so, you know, they're the ones that actually made this happen. Um, you know, Joe Isiger, uh, Isiger at USGS, you know, also instrumental. Um, he is a statistician and biometrician, um, and you know he helped develop the survey plan uh, as well as you know process our our final survey and results into an actual population model. So I'm not going to talk about the population models. Um, you know, it's definitely a really interesting, uh, innovative field. You know, and with some of these integrated population models too, you know, you can potentially use multiple data sources, um, you know, so the opportunity for citizen-based science is, you know, is is really there. Um, you know, I want to thank Wahi Air, who, you know, piloted the survey. Uh, they also ran a simultaneous uh, IR camera system. Uh, so it's really cool. And we we're able to kind of look directly at the results between this, this new RGB camera system and the AI processing versus an infrared processing or camera system. Um, you know, we've been working really closely with our colleagues at National Park Service and USGS. Um, up in Alaska, you know, we're still using a lot of this technology um, today. You know, we had some surveys going on this summer that are currently being processed by this, uh, this technique. Um, and uh, of course, thank you, Ulaka, uh, for putting on this, you know, incredible uh, symposium and, and having me to speak here, um, as well as everybody who's committed to our conservation of these coastal ecosystems, you know, such a precious, precious resource. And, you know, I thank you all for being here and, and just showing interest um, and, you know, a bunch of awesome talks uh, so far. All right. So, um, just a brief little overview of this large scale survey that we did in Southeast Alaska in 2022. So this is like a once in a decade kind of survey. We haven't had information from a lot of these areas for, you know, 10, 15 years even. Um, you know, so we completed the survey over 27 days, um, you know, from May to June. Um, you know, a couple of weather days, a couple of maintenance days. Uh, but we were really lucky. We had, you know, pretty good weather throughout. Um, definitely made it a lot smoother. Um, you know, it was really awesome to get down there, you know, and really, you know, experience the, the Southeast Alaskan community. Um, I'm pretty new to the sea otters uh, and all that. So, you know, it was great actually getting kind of out there, uh, getting up in the plane, you know, meeting with all the, the local folks as well. Um, so, you know, awesome experience, um, you know, but after, you know, 4,600 miles of, of survey, you know, capturing images every second and a half, you know, what do we do with, the, that terabytes and, and terabytes worth of, of information. Um, so, you know, a little bit about our plane, you know, we had this uh, P-68, uh, which is awesome because it had the dual engines, you know, allowed us, you know, to safely, uh, you know, go over water um, and, you know, not worry about an engine blowing out and being able to safely make it back. It's also had a really cool belly port, which that IR camera uh, was, you know, put out of. Um, but, you know, our camera that we're talking about mostly is this camera pod, which basically uses dual 50 megapixel Canon RGB cameras. 
you know, and this technology is applicable to any sort of cameras, right? So these are just DSLRs. Um, you know, you can get off the shelf Nikons and, you know, if we compare the GPS data, you know, we can make a lot of, a lot of things happen. Um, so this is what we use in particular, you know, we were flying at about, you know, 700 feet, you know, so our ground surface area that we covered was, you know, roughly about 350 meters. Um, and that gave us, you know, pretty good resolution, you know, but, you know, we're definitely looking into upgrading cameras and, you know, staying relevant um, and, you know, continuing to kind of use the the newest and best technology. Um, so this camera system is a little outdated. It has caught, caused a lot, a lot of problems. Um, so we have moved to a dual Nikon system. Um, the nice thing about this camera is the, the pod system. So, I mean, you can hook this thing up to a Cubs or Cessnas, um, you know, but even if you have like a blimp or a drone, um, you know, any sort of, of imagery, you know, we can even apply a lot of these techniques to like still imagery um, or imagery from the ground. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's, you know, this was the tool that we needed for our situation, um, covering these vast, uh, remote stretches of coastline. Um, but, uh, the application can be, you know, as big or as small as we want it to be. Uh, you know, I'd even thought about, hell man, it'd be, be cool to put cameras on the bottom of like jetliners. Um, because I know that they run like a pretty standard route and, you know, if we could have them recording data, you know, daily, we could get, you know, a whole different perspective versus, you know, you know, once every 10 years. And yeah, we covered a huge amount of area and we wouldn't be able to do that on, on a daily scale. But, you know, this is, these are, you know, new technologies that I think, you know, could really revolutionize, revolutionize the way that we look at things. Um, so just a little background about the IR system. I'm not going to talk about it too much, um, you know. But it was really cool to, you know, have this technology available to us, be able to compare our results with the, you know, standard DSLR cameras versus this, you know, $500,000 camera, right? So you can get a really nice top of the line uh, DSLR for, you know, a couple thousand dollars, you know, but this one, you know, I think runs 500000 or something like that. Um, so this is the, you know, the camera that they actually use on a lot of like the government uh, military like predator drones and whatnot. Um, so it has, you know, an RGB camera as well as an infrared camera in there and, and various stages of zoom. Um, but this all requires a highly trained observer, you know, to be operating this, you know, within the plane. A lot of the RGB stuff is, you know, you can kind of set the camera up and, and let it go. Um, but this requires 100% constant attention. You know, looking back at the camera operator, uh, you know, throughout the whole survey, you know, I don't know how she did it because um, she had a uh, like a hood on like a sheet over her system, you know, and she was for eight hours a day, you know, locating these otters, zooming in, validating, um, you know, updating data sheets, you know, in a moving plane. Um, so definitely shout out to her. So you can see here, these are a couple examples of the infrared images you know and these otters just shine um which is awesome um and we're able to kind of identify these little shimmers and then zoom in and about and you know verify that they're actually otters you know so it even performs really well in this kelp you can see that you know huge difference with this infrared but it's five hundred thousand dollars and you know not the most user accessible uh, system, you know, so how do we, you know, hopefully, you know, use this, use new technology as a community and not have to spend, you know, a million bucks. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about a bit with some of this RGB stuff and the AI processing. So what did our RGB cameras see? Um, so here's an example image. You know, we were working with, you know, roughly 9,000 by 6,000 pixels. So it's pretty large pixels, pretty large, um, images, you know, and at full size, these otters are just specs. Um, you know, when I first started doing this, I would often have to like squint and, you know, brush off my computer because I couldn't tell if something was an otter or if it was a piece of dust. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, how do we get from these images to usable data? So this was all supported by our machine learning protocol. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a bit about that in a, 
a little while, but now I'm just going to do a little Where's Waldo, you know, I spy uh, with y'all. So we'll take a bit of time, you know, just to check out this image. You know, really awesome shot, you know, great kelp coverage. You know, you can see this wave action. You know, can you guys spot the otter here? Right, right down there in the bottom, you know, so we were able to identify otters, you know, oftentimes that you wouldn't even be able to see manually, you know, some otters were so tangled up in kelp, you know, only had little bits ex exposed and, you know, we were still picking them up with this, you know, AI model. Here's another one, you know, really interesting, you know, we could potentially look at, you know, intertidal zones, um, you know, shoreline a little higher quality uh, resolution data for that, um, you know, as well as getting information on water color and clarity um, that we could potentially use to supplement a lot of this stuff. Um, but here you see we got two otters up here. It looks like a mom and a pup, you know, a couple down here. So we have 10 otters overall in this picture. Give you about five seconds on this one. And then kind of move on through it. But, you know, it was just an incredible experience to be able to, you know, observe Alaska um, and our, our coast this way. Um, you know, one thing that I, I had never really, you know, seen at this scale was, you know, how these kelp forests actually influence, like, you know, the surface of the water. You know, so from the aerial view, you could clearly see, you know, even when there wasn't kelp at the surface, you know, you could see this change in water, um, you know, just how, you know, protective this kelp is. Um, and, you know, influences, you know, everything in the system. Um, so being able to actually get out there, you know, in the plane, but also, you know, with the hours and hours and hours I have of processing data, you know, I think it gives me a interesting perspective on, on this kind of thing. Um, so here you can see that zoomed in, you know, this was a pretty good image, you know, but not always do we have such clear images. Um, you know, you can kind of see a little nose there, you know, some appendages, maybe a tail. Um, that's all real nice. But what happens when you have a nice brown blob? Um, you know, and even with our cameras, we were still getting, you know, a lot of what we call ambiguous counts um, that we couldn't even determine as humans. Um, so, you know, that was kind of one of the hurdles that we had to go through. Um, and, you know, to deal with that, uh, what we did is, you know, we had a ambiguous category um, that we were labeling otters if we weren't sure. Um, and then after that, we had a, a multi-observer protocol that was able to go through those ambiguous counts and then, you know, vote on them to, you know, actually determine their final designation. Um, but as, when I see, you know, more and more uh, improvements in, in camera technology, um, you know, it's amazing like what we have in our pockets nowadays. Um, so I, I think that this is just going to get easier and easier. Um, and we're just going to get more accurate and more accurate. But I think that, um, you know, DOI in general in Alaska has laid a really good baseline for, you know, how we apply these surveys on a, on a large scale. So quite a couple in here. You can see they're all kind of mixed up through the kelp. You know, oftentimes you would see otters that are kind of like holding on and wrap themselves up in this kelp. Um, so just really cool uh, images that I have throughout. But, you know, also a bunch of images that are just, you know, blank, wide open ocean. Um, and, you know, going through those manually, you get so mentally fatigued and exhausted that, you know, that influences your decisions. And, you know, hopefully with these this AI assisted protocol, we can kind of minimize some of that observer bias. Um, you know, we also saw a bunch of other stuff. Um, so not just otters, we caught bears, you know, a bunch of different species of porpoises, you know, all sorts of birds, um, you know, seals and sea lions, of course. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the earlier presentation on, on ROVs that, that Zach did was an awesome compliment to this because, you know, with these aerial imagery, you know, how do we observe things on the surface um, or above the water? And with, uh, you know, the ROV stuff is, you know, how do we start 
to understand what's going on beneath the water. Uh, so I think it'd be great to, to pair these two technologies so we can get, you know, a real comprehensive view on, on what's actually going on. Um, you know, this is another incredible photo, one of my favorite from the surveys. Um, and this looks to me like, like an active sea lion breeding colony. Um, so you can see some of the kind of blood spatters um, you know, along here. And there's a bunch of little pups you know, all around this photo, you know, and this was just, you know, caught on survey, you know, looking for sea otters. Um, you know, what else can we, you know, find from these, these images? Um, you know, because oftentimes, like, especially with like seabirds um, and stuff, they have data sets going back, you know, close to a decade. Um, so can we harvest any sea otter data? Can we harvest any of these other, you know, interest target species? Um, can we harvest that data from prior years? Um, you know, can we look at near shore habitats? Can we do any habitat mapping? You know, I know for certain, you know, I've experimented a bit with this kelp distribution, you know, and being able to identify kelp within these images and then map that uh, on a larger scale. You know, all this stuff is, is more than possible. Um, and, you know, I think we're at the nexus point where, you know, hopefully, you know, as a DOI, we can all come together um, and begin these, these huge kind of multi-species surveys, you know, where we're covering sea otters and seabirds and, you know, forage fish, large whales. And, you know, I think the opportunities are, are really endless. Um, you know, so currently we've had coordination with U.S. Fisheries Wildlife Service, um, you know, USGS, National Park Service, uh, with NOAA, you know, but I'm also interested in, in working with, with you. Um, so if you guys are interested in this in collecting data, maybe, uh, applying some of these methods and, you know, let me know, uh, my contract is up at the end of this month and, uh, fishers and wildlife, but, you know, I think that this is just such a, a powerful tool, um, and I want to, you know, continue working on it. Um, so, you know, working on a couple of grants, uh, you know, for various projects to, you know, expand accessibility to this program, you know, as well as kind of create a user guide that, you know, folks can use to create their own models, you know, and apply this to different species. You know, and, you know, the main impetus behind the creation of our application, which we're calling Sea Otter, um, is, you know, user accessibility, um, but also this human validation uh, aspect. And, you know, while AI is great, it's not perfect, uh, nowhere near perfect. And, you know, we got a long ways before we'll get there. You know, so how do we harness this tool to increase our efficiency, but we still use, you know, human input to validate, you know, what the model is saying. So that's kind of what our main... Uh, yeah, main application is is doing. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how I built the model um, and, you know, how you could apply this to different species. Then we'll go about it, you know, end-to-end -end data processing. Um, so this building of the model was all done before uh, the survey was completed um, on, you know, test surveys over the past five years. So how do we build a object detection model? You know, first we have to have images. You can either collect these if you have a, a drone, you know, an ROV, uh, you know, any sort of camera, um, you could really get images, whichever way you want. Um, but, you know, one of the, the key things is, you know, if I have a bunch of aerial images of otters, um, you know, I don't want to put like a image of an otter from a boat. You know, if my goal is to predict otters and aerial images. Um, so we were pretty careful about using, you know, specific guidelines the height of the camera, you know, training it on uh, the camera system that we're using through the Southeast survey, um, you know, but we can also make more general models that are applicable to multiple uh, altitudes and, and multiple camera models. But, you know, we wanted to just kind of maximize our performance of the model. So that's kind of why we did that. Um, you know, after you collect the images, you have to go through and manually label. And this is to me, the worst part. Um, so my first couple of months were just spent, you know, scroll on image after image of blank ocean and you know occasionally you'd have a, a sea otter pop up um so you know like this image here we got a, a group what i would do is i would kind of draw a box around each individual otter so this kind of gives us the data that you know 
this is where the otter is within the image. Um, and that can talk to the, the model later on. So we went through and, you know, I started with, you know, probably seven or 800 uh, observations of, of sea otters. Um, so, you know, you don't have to start with this super huge, robust data set. You know, one of the really cool things is you can incorporate this active learning pipeline, you know, to as you collect more imagery, you know, you're constantly updating your model um, and you're constantly growing that that training set, um, you know, until it's it does what it needs to do. Um, so we have our labeled data, uh, then we have to split that up into our training data, which is actually going to go in and inform the model. We have our validation data, which is going to kind of help adjust the model um, to see. Uh, yeah, it's going to adjust the model, but it's not actually in the training data uh, that initially went in there. And then we have our testing data that the model hasn't seen at all. Um, and that's how we kind of evaluate a lot of the performance of these. So once we have all of our data split, uh, we are able to go in there uh, and crop and tile the images. So, uh, you know, at least with my computer, uh, I'm not able to train a data set on this whole, you know, 9,000 by 6,000 pixel image. So I go in and I extract, you know, you know, about a thousand pixel squares um, from the image, you know, which I then use for the training data. And that did not, there we go. Cool. So those first four steps are really the, the huge hurdles that you have to get across to, to train a machine learning model. Um, they, you know, getting the data prepped and ready, uh, you know, is really a big big part of it. You know, once you get to actually train the model, the computer does most of the work. So uh, it's pretty easy there. Um, you know, I'm working on, you know, hopefully some additions to CRR where we'll be able to like incorporate a lot of this training into it. But right now we're just using it to predict and validate. So after we train a model, um, we can apply it to new images, you know, gather predictions. And this way we can kind of not have to manually go through every single image. Now we have a subset of images that the model has identified as potential otters or potential other species, right? And you can actually go in there, manually validate, say, you know, this is an otter, this isn't an otter. Um, and you can correct the model that way, you know, and you can do that over iterations. So, you know, let's say we take our first model, this rough model we built, and then we apply that on a thousand images and we pull out a couple of sea otters, right? Then we can retrain the model with these new sea otters um, and then we can apply that on a different data set and you know it's just this big snowball effect and, and we're able to create these super robust data sets you know and continue and continue to, to evolve this model so yeah after we do that we can just kind of repeat that until we have enough images you know i was working with um you know several thousand i want to say seven or eight thousand images of otters uh by the time that we were, were done training images. And now we have a model and we run it on our data and this is our output. What does that mean? Um, how is that, you know, biologically significant to us at all? Um, and, you know, what this is, it's saying, you know, we have an otter at this location within our image, you know, but it doesn't say, you know, where spatially, um, you know, or globally that is located. Um, and how do we get from this output to usable data? Um, and that's the process I'll show you right now. So we're gonna collect our images. Now, aerial surveys, what we did in Southeast, you do drone survey, you do a boat survey, whatever images you wanna collect. Um, but they have to be within the scope of the images that you trained your model on. You know, from there, uh, we're going to input them into Sea Otter. So I'll show you the application in a bit, uh, but it, you know, allows you to import images, you know, run our actual predictions, and then validate those. You know, from there, you press a button, and it automatically processes all of our data. So you don't have to have any coding background or experience. You know, you don't know, need to know Python. Um, you know, you can literally use this, you know, graphic user interface you know, that guides you through every step of the, the process. So then we manually review the photos, you know, make sure what the model is calling otters are actually otters. Um, and then, you know, finally, 
we can generate our results. Um, and from there, we can automatically geo-reference otters, you know, and the actual image bounding boxes. You know, we can create effort layers. Um, you know, we go in there, automatically remove any potential double counts, uh, and then we're able to generate both CSVs and shape files, you know, with clean, usable data. You know, and, and the beauty of this now is, you know, it's standardized across um, Alaska, you know, so every time we have photo surveys, all the data is going to be in the exact same format. And this can be, you know, especially useful for, you know, expanding out to larger citizen-based science projects, you know, where you have a bunch of different observers. And, you know, this will actually make sure that at the end of it, we all have the, you know, exact same clean results files. So this is the, what the program looks like, you know, up here in the top left, you know, we're able to create new surveys. Um, we can go here, this big green play button, you know, once we create our survey, upload our images, we just press that and it runs the model through all of our um, predictions. And, you know, currently um, we're able to run on CPU and GPU. Um, so with the uh, GPU, with the gra graphic um, processing unit, uh, we're getting about like one and a half seconds per image, but on the CPU, it's about seven seconds an image. Uh, so hopefully, you know, looking for funding sources to be able to host this on a, on a cloud service so you can actually go in there um, and you don't have to rely on, you know, your government laptop or, you know, your Chromebook that you have laying around. Um, so, you know, once we run the survey, uh, and the predictions, we're able to see, you know, how many images we have, you know, how many predictions we have, and we're going to go into this Otter Checker 9000, uh, which is our validation side of the program. So that displays all of our images, as well as all of our predictions, and all of this prediction data. It allows us to seamlessly, you know, go from one prediction to the next, you know, and really, you know, shave seconds off of, of, images or processing these images. But, you know, those seconds really add up, you know, when you're processing 300,000 images. So, you know, you can see here we have two predictions, you know, one in the, the top right and one in the bottom left. We can zoom in on those um, and we go through every single prediction and we're able to label it yes or no. Here, we can obviously see an otter. So I'm going to label that yes. You know, also we have our plane altitude uh, a lot of uh, different camera settings we used, uh, lat and long of the actual otter, um, as well as lat and long of the camera. Um, and then we can even get into potential measuring. So this is still a bit rusty, you know, but based on our altitude and projecting uh, these images onto space, we can get measurements for each of these boxes. So how big are these otters? You know, if I have something that's showing up as, you know, roughly a meter, that's definitely more congruent with an otter than, you know, some of these seabirds that may present like an otter that are, you know, more like half a meter or quarter meter even. Um, so that really helps kind of go through and kind of get some background on, you know, how big these otters are, where they are in space. Um, but, you know, the model's not perfect. You know, there are a lot of dark brown blobs out there that look a little bit like otters. Um, so we're able to go through there and remove any of these potential false positives. Um, so we marked that as a no, you know, really scroll through and, you know, get through a bunch of images. Um, so, you know, I personally put my eyes on probably 20,000 images um, over, you know, the course of this. But, you know, granted, there were 300,000 images in total. So we were able to, you know, really reduce the total amount of workload there. Um, so, you know, definitely a lot easier when you have these super high contrasts. Um, you know, bright blue background and, and nice dark otter. You can see the tails, um, but it's not always that easy. So this, you know, once we go through all the validations for all of our images, uh, we can generate our results. So generating results is going to georeference things uh, and create these output shape files. They'll also produce CSVs as well, as well. But you can see this, you know, lighter blue. That's our effort. So, you know, what area did the camera actually cover? And then you have all these points where, which are our otter locations. So we're able to get, you know, density on transect. Uh, we're able to see, you know, how these otters are distributed in space. 
uh, and also get an, an accurate usable count out of that. So this particular image is from Glacier Bay National Park in 2022. Um, you can see we got a, a nice hot spot right there, close to the mouth. And here is our results file for the whole southeast. We also have surveys running up in Cook Inlet, um, but I don't have any images of those. So this is our final output from Sea Otter. As you can see, it's you know pretty user friendly, and it kind of you know is easy to generate, which is is the best part because I've spent hours and hours and hours cleaning data, collecting data, processing data, um, and I knew there had to be a better way. So, you know, that's kind of why I've I've dove so deep into this kind of stuff and help you know the future generations and you know future studies to to not have to do all that. Um, so we can see a comparison here between our RGB on the right and the infrared on the left. As you can see, you know, they track very well. Um, so based on, on those comparisons, we know that th these RGB cameras, you know, a couple thousand dollars off the shelf, you know, you could probably get a GoPro if you're flying with a drone, um, are, are able to perform similarly to a, you know, $500,000 unit with a trained crew. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, and the possibilities of potentially, you know, expanding this to the larger community, I, I think are huge. So thinking about time, um, you know, how much time does it take to process these surveys? So, you know, on average, we were getting, you know, 20,000 images a day um, in the Southeast and, and across Alaska with our dual camera system. Um, so, you know, it takes the AI model about one and a half seconds to process this. You know, if you've got it on your laptop, it, it may take a, a couple days. Um, but, you know, on a, a bigger high power computer, you can get done processing in, in about eight hours um, of computer processing. It's just you hitting the button and then you can leave for the afternoon and, and make sure you clock all those hours. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and then, um, you know, approximately 10% of those photos are marked for validation. So you have about 2,000 photos that you were going to manually go through. Um, you know, and with the Sea Otter application, you're able to, you know, quickly, you know, just roar through all that. Um, you know, so it takes about four hours to complete these 2,000 photos. So all in all, you know, about 12 hours for a processing for a full day of, of survey effort. Um, and that's only four hours of paid labor. But you know, I don't want to think about it in the money saved for labor, more so, you know, the eyes and sanity saved for our observers. You know, I've looked at, at thousands and thousands of images and, you know, by the end of the day, my eyes are a little blurry. So um, I think it'll put this next statement in context a little bit. So if we were to do full manual validation, this is just for one day takes about 30 seconds to do a photo. Um, you know, and that's variable. Some people do as much as like a minute. But, um, you know, if you're really roaring through them, you can get it done in about 30 seconds. Um, and then, you know, that's, you have to zoom in, you know, a fair bit, a couple hundred percent and systematically scan every single image. Um, so, you know, for those 20,000 images, that's going to be 166 hours. So over, a, you know, a month of, of man time. Um, and then, you know, we think about the whole survey, you know, that would have taken a single person like a year working nonstop, looking through photos. Um, you know, we can get larger groups to do this, but you know, once we start getting to these big scales, it's really not feasible. Um, so, uh, you know, we do currently have a ground truth experiment in progress, you know, where we've taken eight manual observers with varying experience of, of sea otter research. Um, and uh, we've had them do both manual observations on a certain number of photos and use this AI assisted protocol on these photos, um, you know, and preliminary results show that the AI assisted protocol is, you know, performing within the range of variation that we see between observers. So. Um, you know, we think that this could potentially reduce bias, um, but also, you know, give very similar results than these humans would. Um, you know, also interesting that the AI also is um, within the range of variation that we see within a single observer. Um, so I think that that talks a bit about some of this observer fatigue that I mentioned earlier, where, you know, 
when you're looking through photos for hours and hours and hours, you know, you start getting tired, you start getting lazy. Um, you know, I can speak firsthand um, from that and things get tough. Um, so your, your mindset changes as you do these surveys. So you kind of have this like shifting uh, observer protocol that is really hard to account for. And, you know, just a couple more slides to close this out. I'm going to roar through these so I can get to my next steps. Um, but here, 238 otters. You know, that was a one and a half seconds of, of the processing, right? And here we have 173. Uh, this is a really cool image. Um, you know, I just like how the kelp's all spaced out like this. Um, but you can see we got some otters down the bottom right corner there. So uh, what are the next steps? You know, I think, you know, now that we've proven this technology works, you know, having more frequent small scale surveys, you know, get ideas, seasonal distribution, or, you know, even monthly, you know, we potentially expand this into like a daily survey of, you know, a smaller bay, um, you know, paired with some of that ROV habitat data, you know, I think we can get some really interesting, you know, ask some really interesting questions about behavior, you know, foraging, um, distribution, things like that. Um, you know, already looking into applying it on multiple species. So being able to harvest our seal data, um, you know, because we're already spending so much time, money and effort, you know, collect all this data for otters, you know, it's not just otters out there. All these other organisms are influencing these as well. So, you know, why don't we gather that data as well? You know, there's a plethora of data within these images that we can harvest. Um, you know, we can even go back to historical images and, and pull out uh, data that I'm looking into right now. Um, currently working with USGS um, to, you know, have an open source hosting platform for this application. Um, if you're interested in using it, uh, send me an email. I can give you a, a little copy. Um, you know, it's all built around a specific camera system and, and working for sea otters. Um, so you kind of have to uh, rig it a little differently if you want to apply it for other things. But, you know, reach out to me. I'll help you out with that. Um, you know, our goal is to you know, expand this tool so that the whole larger community can use it. Um, you know, and that definitely includes citizen scientists driven surveys. Um, you know, I foresee people buying off the shelf drones. You know, these little DJI drones are incredible, you know, and people can go out there, collect this imagery, you know, upload it to a portal, you know, and then we have you know, usable standardized data um, that can be incorporated in a lot of these really cool new integrated population models. Uh, you know, and then always continue to evolve this model using new survey data as it comes in. Um, but yeah, uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Colin. Let's see. Um, I I feel like personally I did better over time finding the sea otters in the photos. <laughs> but the, the one you said there was 268 or something otters in the middle of the ocean. Nope, I didn't get that one, unfortunately. Um, but thank you so much for presenting today. I think what you are doing is very important. Um, and I appreciate all that uh information um you're getting lots of compliments in the chat uh if you have any questions for colin please throw them in the chat or the q and a pretty please um what's like it has there been anything unique or different that you've seen in some of these photographs um in terms of it could be animals or anything intriguing yeah um so that one with the sea lions that i shared was you know, definitely the most interesting image um but i've also seen like one where we had like a single sea otter and you know a shark tailing not too far behind um really and, oh yeah um so interesting there i mean at this point is they weren't really doing anything but you know it makes me think mm -hmm. um <sighs> Man, just a lot of really cool landscape. Um, it's really awesome to to see the kelp and, you know, especially a lot of these like tide lines and, you know, you could really see you know, what the ocean is doing with the currents um, just with, you know, basic still images, which I, I think is incredible. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of room for this to grow. Um, but yeah, I think uh, 
yeah, just being able to to view Alaska from a different lens has been very special for me. Awesome. Um, how did you get started with this project? Are you a pilot, Beth asked? No, that is hopefully um in my my goal. Um, you know, I had uh some PhD plans um kind of coming in the pandemic um going overseas and and studying primates um in Cambodia um but you know that all that changed up so I started kind of falling back to available data you know and what we could do with remote sensing um you know that got me kind of down the rabbit hole of a lot of this machine learning so you know I've been working with a lot of those habitat suitability models you know mentioned earlier you know and potentially you know incorporating you know some data into like the ecosystem models uh, that were mentioned earlier as well um but often that yeah especially with the ecosystem models they're just so data hungry um and we didn't have all that data so I got some drones started playing around um asking questions and you know I, I found this awesome opportunity with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to definitely expand it and really dive in super deep. So um, that's kind of how I got where I am now. Very cool. What's what's next on your agenda? Do you even know? <laughs> um, well, I definitely want to continue with this work. Um, you know, i in talks with kind of expanding some of this to seals um, as well as some potential seabirds. You know, I think we could potentially start doing satellite stuff, um, you know, observing whales, um, elk, you know, some of those larger species, maybe yeah. even like um, forge fish and, you know, getting into the kelp and, and all that, that fun stuff as well. Um, you know, I, I did start my own company recently doing survey work um, and AI, you know, wildlife based stuff. Um, so I definitely want to continue working on this. I it's been such a pleasure to work with sea otters, um, and these amazing ecosystems. Um, but I really do like kind of like branching out and and working with a bunch of different things. So, you know, hopefully after we polish all this sea otter stuff up, uh, you know, we can work on on some other projects. But you know, hopefully doing a lot of surveying and uh, uh, with more and more time and computer effort, less computer work. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally does. Um, Gwen is asking, would there be any use in implementing the same technology when trying to identify eelgrass beds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we could, a lot of times, especially in the shallower areas, you know, we'd be able to, to pull that information out. You know, it's just a matter of fact of kind of getting those starting images uh, to start training your models. But, you know, absolutely, we could apply to eelgrass beds. Um, you know, we might might be able to find some some animals down in there too. Um, mm -hmm. Cool thing about the RGB compared to the IR um, is you can it kind of pierces into the water. So unlike the IR, which you know, if you had an otter that was like a foot under the surface, you know, it would kind of show up. It wouldn't show up at all. But mm -hmm. you know, with this RGB and you know varying clarity conditions, you know, sometimes you can see pretty deep. So you know, I'd be interested to applying it. You know, in some underwater systems as well. But ROV may be better suited for that. Got it. Is there any other um, software like this for other um, animals that's as advanced as 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 advanced? Did I say that right? It's been a long symposium. <laughs> uh, as your sea otter AI program. Um, well, I don't want to toot our own horn too much. Um... But, you know, the reason why we developed this is because we didn't have, you know, a comparable solution. You know, there are a lot of apps that you can view your images um, or, you know, potentially, you know, uh, process the images. But actually having this, you know, uploading images, processing them, validating them and exporting the data. Um, I think that was, you know, the main reason behind, you know, what we have. And I haven't found anything like it. Awesome. Well, toot toot. I'll toot your horn for you. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, so thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. Uh, we're really grateful for your work and we're looking forward to where it goes next. Awesome. Thank you guys so much.